Hello, and welcome to this Center for Brooklyn History talk. I'm Marcia Eli from the Brooklyn Public Library, the Center for Brooklyn History, and the library's arts and culture team, BPL Presents. Tonight, we have the enormous honor of hosting Dahlia Lithwick. Her new book is Lady Justice, Women, the Law, and the Battle to Save America. Dahlia is among the most highly regarded legal analysts today. She is senior editor at Slate. She hosts Amicus, Slate's award-winning podcast about the law and the Supreme Court. She is a regular contributor on MSNBC and has appeared on CNN, ABC, The Colbert Report, The Daily Show. Her work has been published in the New York Times, Harper's, The New Yorker, The Washington Post, to name a few. And she's received an abundance of awards and honors, ranging from a National Magazine Award to her 2018 induction into the American Academy of Arts and Sciences. Her magic is making so many thorny, complicated legal questions understandable and helping us to understand why we should care. This new book, Lady Justice, looks at the Trump years through a particular lens. It brings us stories of the tough, determined, brilliant women lawyers, some of whom are household names, some of whom we've never heard of, who stood up and used our laws, imperfect as they may be, to move the needle forward towards a more just and equal society. It's a powerful book, an important book, and a hopeful book. So tonight I'm very excited to share that Dahlia's conversation partner is like her, a remarkable and inspiring woman lawyer who makes a difference. There's much that I can say about Zephyr Teachout, former New York gubernatorial candidate, law professor and author. But for the purpose of leading into this conversation, I want to zoom in on her anti-corruption expertise and spotlight her role as the first lawyer to write about Trump's looming, looming emoluments violations and along with Citizens for Responsibility and Ethics in Government, suing Trump a week after he was elected for taking foreign payments and violating the Constitution's emolument clause. I am so eager to hear from these two women, but before I hand it over to them, I want to let you know that you can explore Lady Justice by going to the link in the chat that leads to our partners at the community bookstore and lets you, if you so desire, purchase a copy from an independent business. I also wanna let you know that you have the option for closed captioning tonight. That button is at the bottom of your screen. And finally, I invite you to share your questions, questions tonight. Type them into the Q&A box also at the bottom of your screen. And with that, it is my enormous honor to welcome Dahlia Lithwick and Zephyr Teachout to join me here on camera. I want to thank you both so much. I'm grateful, so much, so grateful to both of you for being here. And I will turn it over to you. Thank you so much, uh, Marsha. Um, this is such a real honor and delight. I remember in February of 2000, when my co-clerk, I was clerking, my co-clerk said, you've got to read this Lithwick person. <laughs> and so began 22 years of getting to read and listen to Dahlia Lithwick, who has such a remarkable voice, insight, um, wisdom, intelligence, and I have my book here, which we'll be talking about tonight. It's um, it's a remarkable book about a moment, five and a half years when we move from uh, the end of the abortion wars to Dobbs, <laughs> you know, just total transformation, and also a remarkable book about law. And we're going to talk a little bit about more about that. But I want to start, Dahlia, because you're such a remarkable storyteller. I want to start with one of your Brooklyn nights. There's a there's a lot of wonderful, amazing women in this book. Um, uh, incredible storytelling, and many of them have ties to Brooklyn. So um, let's can you can you tell us a little bit about um, uh, Brigitte Amiri? 
there's a, a passage which is so ex <laughs> exemplifies so many passages in the book where where uh, Brigitte is saying, you know, looking at this case, okay, I'm looking at this, I'm going to go home, put my kid to bed, write the temporary restraining or orders, this is an easy case, you can't ban abortion, and that of course is not what ends up happening in that case. But can we just start with that story um, of, of her case and her lawyering? <laughs> Um, yes, and I also want to thank you and Marsha and just note, I don't think I've been able to say this on a Zoom about this book. I wrote huge chunks of this book at the Brooklyn Public Library, um, often because, and we can talk about the juggle, but like I was escaping my kids, <laughs> I was escaping, right? Um, so so it is funny that um, it, it feels a little bit like a homecoming. Um, Bridget and Mary is a really interesting character in the book she's um you know she she's been at the ACLU for a long time uh she like so many women in this book believed that Hillary Clinton was going to win the election and everything was going to get finished like you said Zephyr right like we have a little bit of loose ends to tie up we're so close to parity and equality like we'll do a little stuff around incarcerated women and abortion but mostly we're done and then boom um the 2016 election happens and this is an, a really interesting story of uh a young woman, a, a, a refugee, a migrant who's in a shelter in Texas. She's pregnant. She gets a waiver from a Texas judge, which is hard to do to terminate a pregnancy. This is not an easy lift to get a waiver in Texas. And then she's prepared to go terminate her pregnancy and the shelter won't let her out the door. And the Trump administration um, and a whole bunch of arms of the Trump administration are like, oh no, we can't facilitate abortion. So even though you're entitled to terminate your pregnancy, even though you've jumped through all these hoops, we're quite literally not letting you outside the shelter. And as you said, Zephyr, she's like, this is an easy case. Like we still have a right to abortion. She's gotten a waiver in Texas. Uh, she ends up taking this case all the way to the DC Circuit Court of Appeals, loses there, ends up winning uh, uh, en banc when the whole panel sits. Uh, but a couple of parts of the case are really interesting, and I think this is why you led with it. Not only is Bridget a New Yorker, to be clear, but also um, because it's such a canary in the coal mine case, right? I mean, it seemed as though all this was behind us, and what she encountered in litigating this case was a just completely fanciful notion from uh, you know the the Donald Trump administration that if I open the doors and let you go, then I am somehow helping you do this thing that is sinful. And you know we can talk about um, the person who was uh, the head of that um, uh, uh, bureau. But the larger point is that the Donald Trump administration fought to the end, not only to keep this uh, person from terminating a pregnancy, but as it turned out, they were monitoring women in shelters, you know, who was fertile, who had their periods, were talking people out of terminating pregnancies. And all of this ends ultimately in uh, this one young person, Bridget wins her case, this one young person is able to terminate her pregnancy. And two things happen that are worth talking about. One is that the Donald Trump Justice Department tried to take away her license, which is shocking, Bridget's license to practice law. Uh, the other is that very, very soon after, here we are in 2022, and uh, in about half the states very soon, it will be impossible to terminate a pregnancy lawfully. So this was what was meant to be the end and what turned out to be the beginning. Yeah, it's also a story of locking somebody up. And there is this refrain throughout the book. There's these incredible hopeful moments, incredible uh, leaders, and this background chant. Um, what does lock her up? Uh, what does it mean to you? And what do you think it meant in our society? And why is it this refrain that you return to? I mean, I was thinking about it probably the same way you were in 2016, which is that people were going to Donald Trump rallies and shouting about Hillary Clinton, lock her up, lock her up. And, and I think 
we thought that was rhetoric, right? It was no different from the people who were yelling, iron my shirts, right? It was just like revanchist, chauvinist, whatever. And then over those years, and you really see it in the case you just described, it started to feel like, oh, this is an actual threat. I mean, Donald Trump actually wants Hillary Clinton to go to jail for her emails. He's actually threatening to have his Justice Department investigate her for her emails. And then, um, as you suggest, Zephyr, throughout the book, you know, we're hearing lock her up directed at AOC, at Nancy Pelosi, at Christine Blasey Ford. And suddenly it's not just rhetoric anymore. Suddenly it feels as though the entire criminal justice system, which you and I have spent our lives assuming made us free and equal and have, you know, dignitary interests and have bodily autonomy could just turn and could be weaponized against us to put us in jail. And in case folks think I'm being hyperbolic, let's be very, very specific and clear. And I wrote this into the epilogue in the days between the book was supposed to go to print and when Dobbs came down. But we are now looking at an America in which women in Oklahoma, in Alabama, in Texas, are being hauled off to jail for terminating pregnancies, for having miscarriages that seem suspicious. We are going to see more and more and more actual purposive lock her up to take the entire machinery of the criminal justice system that was supposed to be making us free to punish us. And so I think, and maybe this is a little bit of an answer to the question, wasn't this book supposed to be about ancient history, right? This was supposed to be about the Trump era, it's over. And yet I think Dobbs was such a reminder that this is not only ongoing, but escalating. Yeah, well, let's get to the hopeful part first for a second, <laughs> because this is a profoundly hopeful book and it's a real, def it's a real institutionalist defense. <laughs> Um, and almost all of the women that you profile, um, you may not think of first and foremost as institutionalists, but as you interview them and as they talk about um, their own vision of law, they, they are not using law just instrumentally. They have a vision of the rule of law. Um, so uh, could you just spend a minute, maybe we'll pick out a few, um, you know, Yates and uh, 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 Vanita, uh, as two women who are profoundly, you know, committed to the institution of law, although they have different ways of uh, very different <laughs> approaches, and they're both, both government lawyers, but... Um, I mean, I think in a sense, Zephyr, you've just surfaced like the tension in the book, right? Which is, this is not a book about the Women's March in some sense. It's not a book about, you know, the astounding women in Iran right now who are putting their bodies on the streets to try to um, be treated with dignity. This is a book about women in law, which is really different, right? Like suddenly they have this amazing magical toolbox that like with the help of a yellow pad and a pen and, you know, a, a license to practice, like suddenly you can change the world. And with that comes this tension that you're pulling up, which is, but law sucks. You know, sometimes law is used to hurt people and harm people. And historically in the United States, law has overwhelmingly be, been used, I think, to harm and marginalize and subordinate women and people of color and other communities that are vulnerable. And so every woman in the book is on the seam of the thing you're describing, which is I work in the law, I love the law. Also, I am so aware, A, of its history, purposed against women, and B, of its possibility to hurt us again. And so, you know, the women you mentioned are like, in some sense, and, and I tried to have every woman in this book be somewhere on that continuum of how much confidence can I put in a system that both gave us Roe v. Wade and gave us, you know, equal pay and gave us, or what passes for equal pay, you know, what gave us the Lilly Ledbetter Act, but also how much can I put confidence in a system that, as I suggested, could turn on us and also historically, you know, had us burnt at the stake as witches. And so, so 
Bella Yates is a funny, you know, I start with her only because she's just all in. I mean, she talks about law. I've often said she's like a Frank Capra character, right? Like she just talks about it with such reverence. She's the head of the Justice Department, the acting attorney general uh, under Donald Trump until they can swear in Jeff Sessions. And she's the person who, in the face of the Muslim ban, uh, just says, no, I'm not going to enforce this. And it's an interesting moment, right? She could have just quit. She didn't quit. She could have enforced the ban knowing that she didn't want to put the imprimatur of the Justice Department with its storied history and all this power on the side of what she thought was fundamentally an anti-Muslim, uh, anti-due process uh, uh, law. So she said, I, I simply will not enforce it. And I use her in the book to make a couple points. One is, what does it mean to be, like, she's a third generation lawyer. She's a white woman from Georgia. She's the head of the Justice Department. She has all this power and privilege. And there's not a lot more people in the Trump era at that high level of government who do what she did, right? They sneak off, they write books, they get contributor gigs at networks. Like, it's pretty amazing what she did. But she did it from this deep conviction that the law has this immutable force and power. It can lift us all up or drag us all down. And she really believes that. Vanita's complicated. Vanita Gupta, you know, worked first, uh, you know, challenging a, a government for a long time. Then she comes in under Eric Holder to the Justice Department under Obama. She has this amazing line in her chapter where she had participated in this incredible drug sting in Tulia, Texas, where all sorts of people of color get swept up in this kind of really bogus sting. She gets them all exonerated. It's a very big lift. And then she says this thing that I've been sitting with, Zephyr, which is, you know, she writes an op-ed where she says, everybody says the system worked. I used the force of the law to get all these people, uh, some of whom had, you know, decades sentences for nothing. She's like, this is not the system working. This is the system broken. The fact that I got them exonerated is not a triumph of the law. And so, and I think you probably picked her for that reason, but like she's sitting in that tension, right? Of, I believe in the law. I use the law to help these people. And also the law has so fundamentally distorted justice for so long. And she ends up being at the leadership conference, she's now um, number three under Merrick Garland at the Justice Department. But she's the person who is both in the system and out of the system. And I sort of use her chapter as a little bit of a thought experiment about what do you do when you're both inside and outside, but also to make this sort of foundational point I think you're making, which is like, what do you do with that uneasiness of both believing in the sort of aspirational qualities that the law could do and also just like living in the reality that if you are a person of color, if you are poor, if you are, uh, um, you know, young, the law has never been your friend. And so, as I said, I think every single person in this book is in that tension on that line. They all um, come down differently. And I guess I should just say Becca Heller, who right. um, another chapter, she's just straight up like the law is garbage. I'm yeah. using the master's tools to take about the part, the master's house. I have no illusion. So in some sense, I think for all of those of us who are thinking through these issues, you can find a piece of yourself in this conversation. Well, I one of the things that, first of all, um, thanks for those little stories. When you're reading this book, which all of you who have not uh, will do, um, <laughs> you will be on the edge of your seat because Dahlia is such a master storyteller about what is going to happen in each of these tense moments. Um, that are not all in court, but are nonetheless, you know, high stakes human moments. But Becca is really, I think, really stands out in this book um, because, I mean, as you, I think, in your own voice start to intimate at the end, it's like without law, there is violence or chaos, you know, like what is, and you use the language of justice, you know, you call Yates Al Capra, but there's still justice, sort of an aspiration and a vision throughout the book, which I, what I love how, 
uh, you know, why, why I'm going to assign it to my law students is that it forces you to think about these tensions in very real ways. Like, what are the real um, options? And I also see these as representing different institutions. So you have the institution of the law, qua law, and Yates. You have Gupta who moves to sort of democracy, the institution of democracy. Um, and then you have uh, Robbie Kaplan, who is, you know, she's got these brilliant theories, but she's trying to get in front of a, of a jury, you know, which is a really different institution. And that the institution that um, haunts this book is the Supreme Court. And, and kind of therefore the constitution, because, you know, so I, I'm really curious um, to hear your thoughts, because you start off with the Bill of Rights, holding the Bill of Rights up here, and then you, you quit covering the court in 2018. And a third of the court is appointed by Trump. And so you can have law without you can have the rule of law without the Constitution. You can have the rule of law without the Supreme Court. What do you, how do you think about the Supreme Court right now, Dahlia? Uh, so this is, you know, I, I have frequently said, um, Zephyr, that the subtitle of this book could easily be called Welcome to My Breakdown, right? Because it is somebody who, you know, I've covered the court. This is my 23rd term. And for the bulk of it, with like a degree of sort of Sally Yatesian reverence, I mean, even if I didn't like Shelby County or Bush v. Gore, I genuinely believe that the court was doing a project that you and I signed up for when we went to law school, which is something akin to justice, just different pathways. And it's been sort of manifestly clear to me that that's not the project at the court anymore. And you can carbon date it to, you know, uh, Merrick Garland not getting a hearing or a vote. You can carbon date it to the Brett Kavanaugh hearings. Uh, you can carbon date it to the somehow the principle that kept Merrick Garland for getting a hearing because it was a pre presidential election was the reason Amy Coney Barrett got mashed onto the court in a presidential election when voting had already started in that election, right? So any number of these could be the inflection point when I started to lose confidence. I think maybe we can agree for purposes of this call that whether it was SB8, the Texas vigilante bill that the court um, approved last year, this time last year, in an unsigned order at midnight without reasoning, um, or Dobbs or the gun case uh, that came down uh, that sort of dismantled New York state gun laws. I think that whatever is happening right now is really different. And we can talk about how and why, but then I think underneath that question is the question you're asking me, which is what do you do if you believe in justice and you believe in the rule of law and you don't think that the court is behaving lawfully, right? And, and so part of me wants to give you the answer that as you said, Vanita Gupta gives, I think it's not an accident that, um, Throughout the book, it seems to be the women of color who overwhelmingly say, I am clocking both the utter ridiculousness of putting all our hopes and dreams into a legal system that has never served us. And also, as Anita Hill says, we don't have a better system. Uh, you, you quoted it, Zephyr. Anita Hill says in the book, there's no plan B. Without law, there's chaos. There's chaos. And chaos will never help the communities that we are seeking to protect, whether you are a woman, whether you are LGBTQ, whether you are young or a migrant, you're not going to do better in whatever plan B is. And as I sometimes cynically quip, plan B is the army, like it's not good. And so we, again, have to sit in the tension that these women, and as I would suggest, the least likely characters in the book to be sort of bullish, about the project of law, you know, Nina Perales, um, who does redistricting, you know, there is no reason for her to be all in for a system that's stacked against uh, Latinas that she serves and thinks about, but she is. And so I think maybe the answer, the complicated answer to your question is, what do you do when you have to sort of dance with the one that brung you? And <laughs> what there is, is the law. And it's not good, and there's nothing better. It's um, 
uh, I, I, we're not going to have a chance to talk about all these amazing women, but I loved the introduction to the her, uh, Nina's incredible work. One of the things that struck me and um, uh, is this is also a, a Gen X book. <laughs> um, everybody is welcome here, but almost everybody was born within a few years of Roe. <sighs> <laughs> uh, with Becca and Anita being the exception. I actually went and did the math on it. It's like, okay, so Sally Yates is, <laughs> is uh, maybe 10 years older, and but they're all within about 15 years, um, you know, late 40s, early to early 60s, which means they were 14 to 25 when Anita Hill um, <laughs> Uh, when Anita Hill was um, spoke up, was an extra, you know, both uh, treated terribly and just an extraordinary, extraordinary brave voice against all the um, all the decks being stacked against her. And then so she comes in towards the end of the book with this profound wisdom, like, yeah, you <laughs> think the system doesn't work. <laughs> and here is how I've come to make sense of it and continuing to work. It's a, it's, um, it's, it's her voice, uh, which has always, I think, meant a lot to me. Um, but her voice in the placement of the book is, is really, really powerful, but, which brings me and I mean, did you, are you welcome to say <laughs> anything you want about that? That guy's a little younger, but everybody else is uh, sort of generationally raised in the 60s and 70s uh women's movement maybe that another no, family wasn't you're looking a little skeptical so <laughs> no i'm actually thinking like i've talked a, a lot about this book and no one has made this point and i wonder zephyr if it answers a little bit of the question which is how was everyone so surprised by dobbs right i mean right. everybody right. when i mean in dobbs like we had SB8, right? The court had essentially nullified Roe already in Texas for one tenth of the population. Then we had the Dobbs oral argument. We all knew Roe was being overturned. Then we had a leak in May and Dobbs comes down the last week of June and everyone is gobsmacked. And I think maybe you're, the way you just framed that question answers that other thing, which is if you only come up knowing the protections of Roe, you can't imagine losing it. And I think maybe part of the reason that so many of the women in this book are struggling the way you and I are struggling in this conversation, but like, wait, isn't the law like lifting us all yeah. up? Isn't the arc of the moral universe taking us to the place that, as you said, Bridget Amiri, that we just like tie up a couple loose ends and we get equal pay and like we get like proper, you know, uh, 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 parental leave and then we're good like done and dusted we're like Norway we're Sweden right and then like right. suddenly we're like citing Matthew Hale famous witch burner from the 17th century and we're moving backward and yeah. I wonder if a little bit of your Gen X point is that for a lot of women two generations older than us none of this was a surprise oh that's really interesting yeah um and so, right, we need to come to a different understanding of history and law and history. <laughs> um, but that doesn't mean that we necessarily give it all up. It's just a different understanding about their relationship. Um, I don't know. I don't know. I don't know. I don't think I feel that solid on it, <laughs> but it's the, the, I, I want to encourage um, in about 10 minutes, I'm going to open it up to questions. So um, if you have listen to amicus and always wanted to ask the question here is your chance um uh, so please put it in the q a box at the at the bottom of the screen um i want i want to talk to you about your own thoughts uh you know we, we just talked about the supreme court now we're talking about another kind of institutional figuring out which is how to deal with um sexual assault and harassment claims um so you in the book are, um, I mean, really raw about your own experience with um, Judge Kaczynski, both your own experience and your own experience of uh, 
choosing when to when you chose to speak and your own experience I, I, i'm summarizing way too much do you want to talk about that very briefly now um and why you chose to include it in this book um so so the the quick version is that in the midst of me too um, it became clear that there was a federal appeals court judge, Alex Kaczynski, who was for a time the chief judge of the Ninth Circuit Court of Appeals, who everybody sort of knew for decades, had been showing porn to his clerks, had been speaking on a, inappropriately, not just to his clerks, to other lawyers, to people in courtrooms. Everybody knew. Um, and I had known. I clerked on the Ninth Circuit. And I had not said a word. Uh, I had certainly told law students who were looking to clerk. I've been very clear. Uh, maybe don't clerk for him. We all knew. Nobody said or did anything. And um, as you suggested, Zephyr, suddenly two women came forward, not me. One of them, Heidi Bond, who had clerked for him and had really suffered like shocking um, inappropriate behavior in chambers. Emily Murphy, who clerked for another judge on the Ninth Circuit, both came forward and said, this happened to me. And then given the opportunity to say, you're right, I'm sorry, I shouldn't have done that, Judge Kaczynski kind of doubled down and belittled um, Heidi, who um, writes novels under the name Courtney Milan, sort of made it sound as though, you know, she writes these saucy romance novels and somehow uh, belittled her. And then I had this like horrifying kind of moment where I had to decide if I was going to say what I knew. And I did. And uh, after I came forward, I think 13 other women came in. There was a huge number of women who came forward and Judge Kaczynski stepped down. So, so two pieces of that that are relevant for our purposes. One is how does everybody keep an open secret for 20 years? How does everybody in the legal profession, right? The profession tasked with the finding of facts, the conclusions of law, the determining of what is true, and nobody did or said anything. So that was my first thing. And in fact, that section of the book is less about me too than it is about complicity and keeping secrets and power. And it's hard, as you say, because I'm like, it's raw and painful. The other thing um, is, I guess I should just say, Judge Kaczynski stepped down. There was no process. There was never an investigation. To this day, we don't actually have a finding of facts about what happened other than these women who came forward. And a couple of weeks ago, he resurfaced because he's now defending Donald Trump in a lawsuit in which he compares the former president to Galileo, you know, a great misunderstood historical fig figure who was probably right about COVID and probably right about the 2020 election being stolen. So what do you do when you have a system, right? This is not the plumbers association. This is not, you know, dental hygienists. These are judges. They are tasked with every single day going into court and deciding sexual harassment and discrimination and, you know, rape, and they can't police themselves. So, so that was one of the things I was struggling with. And maybe that chapter leads into and gets kind of conflated with the chapter about Christine Blasey Ford and how poorly that process worked, that this person could sort of get sent to the wood chipper and, and, and we did nothing to stand up for her. Yeah, I mean, before we, we get to that chapter though, I just thought, I, uh, Dahlia, I, you know, I'm not alone in thinking you're a national treasure, <laughs> national treasure in your honesty and dealing with the issues here, but, I think it very much belongs in this book. Yes, it is about covering up, but it's also about women being seen as full humans and fully, you know, fully recognized and the harms to women being fully recognized as part of the law instead of just this other not serious, um, you know, not really up to the thing that we in the court should be worried about, um, you know, just humanity as opposed to something fundamental in the law. But also, you, okay, maybe I read this wrong, but I think you have a very strong view, which I don't to dwell on what you said, is that nothing was ever resolved. <laughs> And that it's it's a, maybe a little controversial view that that the open secret model 
the whisper network model is not going to work that we if we are going to actually address the problems of sexual har harassment and assault and their impacts we have to insist on process so again it's a kind of return to a vision of law and fact finding and juries and fact finders and however imperfect that is as opposed to we all know is that is that fair or it's not just fair it's that you know i think i said somewhere in the book like we have divvied up the world so that men have law and process and women have feelings right and if you think about the christine blasey ford experience yeah the the painful part i mean it was also painful but the really painful part was having like susan collins and chuck grassley and you know every single one of them was like oh i believe you you're so persuasive it just doesn't matter. And so I think, and it makes me think a little bit, I mean, tell me if this is wrong, Zephyr, of the of the Dobbs opinion where Justice Alito is so entrenched in, look, law means what it meant at the founding. It means what it meant, you know, when we wrote the Reconstruction Amendments. And that means law is about like property and about contracts and like man stuff. And I'm super sorry that your ovary is nowhere present but that means it just doesn't matter. You get your feelings and all your like messy, complicated bodily claims and we get law. And I think that maybe as I'm thinking about this, I'm thinking this actually answers your initial question, which is the reason women have to like muscle into this process is to say, actually, no, like super sorry that you're citing a witch burner, Matthew Hale, in your majority opinion in Dobbs. It has ever been thus and it will ever be thus unless we like push ourselves and literally muscle ourselves into these processes. And it's not enough to just be told, which by the way, is what Anita Hill was told. Like we super believe you, super sorry. Also, we're just like stepping over you and moving on, reconstituting the court, like with a big Anita Hill shaped hole in the middle of it. And so I think maybe that again, slightly answers your question about this like aspiration versus like half, you know, brutality of the law line. The only way to kind of vault into the aspirational part is to like put ourselves into it. Yeah. Um, so let's talk about Dobbs. <laughs> womp womp, yeah. <laughs> what, um, if you believe this is a fundamental right and don't believe that this court is doing law um and are uh, not not willing as none of the women in this book are all these women are facing reality on a daily basis this is not a retreat to your private garden model right so, um and uh what are the most powerful moves that you see now to um uh restore and uh, granted the res restoration feels like the wrong word but to to um fight for women's equal recognition in law in this country um in relationship to our bodily autonomy so so two things that i've thought a lot about one this book would have been much less fun to launch if the midterms had not gone the way they did if the midterms had turned out to be you know the story that the pollsters were telling us like yeah women were a little grumpy for a week there in june but then they realized that the price of gas mattered more and so like they're just not going to show up if that had happened this would have been a really hard book to be <laughs> trying to roll out but the exact opposite happened right in all of the five states where like direct democracy was operative which is to say that abortion was on the ballot not vote suppression, not, you know, but actually getting to vote in every single one, including Kentucky, abortion wins, right? So, so that tells me that there's a reason the last sort of um, third of the book is all about organizing and voting rights. And, you know, people, people keep saying to me, like, you kind of like hooked us in with these funny TikToks of like good law stories, but then you just start talking about like, gerrymandering. And it's like, because we can't, count on just winning in court, right? We got to win through democracy and, and systemic democracy reform. And that's why the book lands on Stacey Abrams, right? Like whatever right. it is, 
it's not just winning cases. It's going to be organizing. It's going to be doing exactly the stuff that got um, uh, uh, Reverend Warnock elected in, in Georgia. So I think that's one answer, which is I think democracy, if it is unfettered from vote suppression and gerrymandering and election um, denialism, like will get us there. And that's amazingly hopeful to me. I think if you think about all those women who got that a um, uh, 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 referendum question on the ballot in Michigan, you know, knocking on doors, getting 700,000 signatures, like that's that's democracy, right? So that's one answer. Yeah. There's another answer that like, if you'll let me do one second of digression. I was really struck at Katanji Brown Jackson's confirmation hearings when challenged by Senator John Kennedy from Louisiana, Marsha Blackburn, time and time again, what is this, all this garbage about women and bodily autonomy and privacy and due process and substantive due process? And I was really stunned that the Democrats on the committee and the nominee in this case didn't advance an argument. They were just like, we don't know. It's just like this made up right. We're not really sure what row is planted in. And I spent a ton of time, and if people mm. listen to the podcast, they will hear, going back and reading why the 13th, 14th, and 15th Amendments contemplated women's bodies the way they did. It's not like a, a throwaway. It's not a party trick that like the right to privacy is in those amendments. It's in those amendments because if you were a former slave and somebody could rape you and take your children away from you, separate you from your spouse, use your body as a unit of economic you know, uh, 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 productivity, and your marriage didn't matter and your children were not your children, the thing that the Reconstruction Amendments gave you, that the 14th Amendment gave you, was your right to decide who you marry, who your children are, how you raise them, right? Those are not like afterthoughts in the Constitution. That is what the radical abolitionists intended to protect with the 14th Amendment. So I guess my sort of question back to you is, why did we give that history away? We ceded all of the history of why women's bodies and why reproductive autonomy and dignity matters, why it's protected in the part of the constitution that wasn't in the Bill of Rights because it had to confer on slaves what real freedom meant. And it's all about your body and your children and your marriage and who you love and who you marry. So why don't we own that history and why don't we tell that history? Right. And so it's sort of a, you know, that if we're seeking a third reconstruction, as Reverend Barber talks about, um, that when we think about law schools for decades now, they have focused on the second reconstruction, not the first. Mm -hmm. I don't know. I'm making this up as we're talking, but, but that, that you only really get to, you get it in a summary course or in history, but it is not sort of core constitutional thinking as much as the mid, mid 20th century court is. And really looking at the uh, first reconstruction, um, which there's lots of reasons to look at as the lost opportunity in this country. I don't I love, know. I love that. And I love the idea. I mean, I'm just looking at my bookshelf and it's like Dorothy Roberts and Peggy Cooper Davis and Michelle Goodwin, like all of these women of color. Yeah. who've been doing for years and years, if you think that you have a right to abortion in America, you've never been Black in Mississippi. <laughs> if you think right. you have a right to raise your children in America the way you see fit, you have never been Black in Alabama. And I think like one of the things, you know, we talked about like the sort of wake-up call that was Dobbs. I think one of the parts of the wake-up call was that a lot of us realized <laughs> that things that we thought were systemic protections were in fact like only protections if you're super lucky. Uh -huh. And if there's going to be another reconstruction, it would actually confer meaningful rights on everyone. Yeah. And so, but you, so, um, there's so much, so interesting. And I know I promised people I would get to questions. <laughs> there are some questions here. Um, I'm going to start with, um, uh, let's see, I've got four questions, people saying nice things. Uh, 
I, uh, Deborah, I don't entirely understand your question, so I'll come back to it. Um, basically, Deborah is saying it's not done and dusted. This is innocent. Now, you know, how have we been too short it, too short sighted, and not inclusive enough in our vision of rights? And I think that's part of what you were answering right there. And and maybe uh, Deborah, sorry, I'm going to take the moderator's license to say, how do you, as a practical uh citizen but a member of our political society engage in a moment where in some ways our dreams are getting bigger and they're getting farther away at the same time <laughs> yeah it's really hard and and to be sure you know i just sat through a week of oral arguments where you know we are actually having a conversation about for the first time ever saying that public accommodations laws that protect everyone if you hang out a shingle and you start a business, you can't be discriminated against. And now there's going to be a carve out, right? For right. for people who have um, a problem with LGBTQ plus Americans. Like we are going forward and backwards at the same time. And, uh, you know, the, the sort of pat answer is, but again, it's the answer that uh, Anita Hill gave me in the book and Sherilyn Eiffel uh, formerly of the NAACP Legal Defense Fund, frequently gives me on amicus, which is it's always been yeah. steps forward, one step back. I mean, anybody who thinks that this is anything but a stutter step, like hasn't actually sort of experienced the the, the arc of history. And so I think part of the answer is, and, and just to Deborah's question, I would just say this, women of color have been saying you're putting too much emphasis on Roe. You don't understand that after the Hyde Amendment passed, huge swaths of the country lost the right, the formal right to terminate a pregnancy. Um, so it's exactly right. Like we we fetishize uh, wins, quote unquote wins that don't actually lift everyone up. And I think that, you know, one of the lessons that, that I've had to sit with, and it goes also, Zephyr, to your question about what we learn in law school, is how much I never learned in law school. Like, the book starts, and we can talk about this at the end, with Polly Murray. Yeah. Is, you know, it turns out, like, the constitutional hero that none of us ever knew about, because I sure didn't learn about Polly Murray in law school. I don't know about you, but nope. I think that, 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 like, part of, and it's a little bit of an answer to this, this same question, which is, if you only let the victors tell the stories, the legal stories and the constitutional stories, then you're only going to keep telling the same stories. And so this book is a little bit about telling the stories of the Polly Murrays of the world who yeah. win and win and win and still nobody knows their name. But it's also about sort of having a much more capacious sense of what the wins are. And that means not only learning seven cases in law school, which we fetishize as like the definition of freedom. Yeah. Um, the Polly Murray section is so exciting. And um, uh, I mean, she's just uh, <laughs> like a truly extraordinary thinker and changer. And interestingly, you know, ends up as a ordained Episcopal priest in a tradition that moved from a progressive vision of history to a vision of history that was far less but put social gospel at the core um you know so that you still must engage in in historic change even if it's back and forth um the uh yeah polly murray anyway polly murray is um uh i I'm sure I'm not the only one who went to go find the documentary after uh, after reading your book. So um, uh, 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 amazing. Uh, Kevin's question is: As a black man battling the realities denied to me by law, how do I increase support for women's rights for myself and by other men? As I believe we don't actualize enough to constantly challenge and change um, patriarchal privilege. Ah, uh, Kevin, I wish you were in the chat in every one of my um, events. I mean, I think, you know, again, the, the book for me needed to land at Stacey Abrams for a lot of reasons. And I want it just right now 
put to rest the idea that if Stacey Abrams doesn't win her campaign, that means that Stacey Abrams lose. Like everyone I think can agree that that Warnock victory in Georgia was Stacey Abrams victory. And so I think that the answer, and again, um, Kevin, it's why there's such an immense focus in the book on organizing because it is irrational to vote right now, if you are a person of color, it is irrational uh, to put stock in, you know, I'm gonna stand in line for nine hours in Georgia and they're gonna pass a law that says you can't give me water while I'm standing in line. And then they try to close Sunday voting. They try to close, you know, uh, uh, souls to the polls. I get every turn, they want the message to be, this is irrational, right? because that's the program. The program is to get you to give up. And so I think that your question is in the face of all that, how do I do it anyway? And then how do I show up and support other people who similarly have every reason to give up? And so that I just turn back to what I think Stacey Abrams has been doing for a long time now, not just in this election, which is knocking on doors and convincing people that you know, it kind of goes back to the Anita, Anita Hill point, like democracy is not perfect. It's flawed from the start, but it's the best game in town because like what we're seeing in Hungary and in, in Russia is not a good alternative. And it's just not a spectator sport. Like we're going to have to sign up. We're going to have to fight. We're going to have to evangelize for a system that is not great. <laughs> and then the act of evangelizing for it and enrolling other people in it and believing in it, which is the hard part right now, is going to be the thing that lifts us all up. And maybe I would just say, just like toggling back to what I said about the election, when I look not just at the women showing up, but the Gen Zs who showed up, you know, these little kids, like my kids are so cynical. <laughs> They're so cynical. And they all showed up to vote. And it's because I think and this goes back to Zephyr and emoluments and corruption. But I just think that, you know, six years of like utter lawless democracy bashing was enough. And if you look at why people showed up to vote, that's why they were terrified for democracy. So I sort of think the answer is what the improv people call yes slash and, right? You show up, you just show up and you do for you and you do for your community, but you do bigger because I think we just now have to reckon with the fact that we live in a profoundly imperfect system that we can perfect. And that sucks because it's really imperfect, but I don't know. I, you know, it's just saying to someone like watching even the oral argument yesterday in this case that wants to like set aside democracy as we know it, it's really interesting to see even the justices retreat from like the brink of crazy see there you go again just believing in the court <laughs> just <laughs> no but it's it's I, I i say that jokingly but it's a serious question which is that i see your move through the book coming to a kind of voting rights voting is the most fundamental uh element for law you know the ability to have power um it's not under threat it's eroded in a lot of places but and you, even with unfair voting laws organizing to make them more fair i mean abram's contributions to america are extraordinary and she's a lawyer's lawyer who ends up as an organizer <laughs> because she sees this power but i also hear in that and this is not stated and so tell me if i have this wrong is that um if you want to go with something closer to democ democracy without the su constitutional su without con um you know constitutional supremacy is that i know that's not what's that's not plausible right now but if you could and and this is a different way to it's a harder or a, a more extreme version of a, of the question from a diane you know should we expand the supreme court to 13 justices I think you can ask that answer that in a broad way. There's expand, there's get rid of judicial supremacy altogether. How how do you think about the court being the final decider and the Bill of Rights, which you start off the book holding up as being the tools that can trump 
um, uh, uh, Trump popular um, laws. So, so I think um, a little bit of the answer to that, again, lies in Justice Alito's opinion in Dobbs, right? Where he says, nothing I can do about it. The word abortion appears nowhere in the constitution. I scoured it. It's just not there. But, you know, and then he says women are not without electoral or political power, right? Which is which is a little bit funny because this is the same conservative supermajority that gave us Shelby County, right? That eviscerated Section 5 of the Shelby County was, for me, the, I mean, as bad as Citizens United was. They just made it up. No, it, it made it up and also, you know, under the most pretextual reasoning right. about, like, we put voting, you know, racial, uh, 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 racialized voting behind us. Thank goodness, right? It's it's a fabrication. But then we get Brnovich that does away with Section Two of the Voting Rights Act, and Rucho, which does away with, you know, uh, uh, political gerrymandering. Like, so this is a court that is consistently choking off the right to vote. And if uh, Moore v. Harper, uh, yesterday's case, like, ends up going the way it may or may not go, really fundamentally altering checks and balances then telling us to go ahead and work it out at the ballot box right I so know. like right. that problem to which my answer is uh, unsurprising it's Vanita Gupta's answer about this is the system working exactly as designed right this is a system rooted in white supremacy and you know giving disproportionate power to white landowning men and slaveholding men that is working precisely as it was designed to work, whether it's through the Electoral College, whether it's through a malapportioned Senate, right? You can just keep winning the Senate and keep never win the Senate, um, or whether it's through uh, uh, Jim Crow and vote suppression and all the ways in which power is distorting. So another element of that, of minority rule, is having a Supreme Court unlike any Supreme Court in any other constitutional democracy worldwide, where you have ter no term limits, right? You right. have lifetime tenure, almost impossible to remove. Um, you have the power to strike down laws that are passed by huge bipartisan margin. Like no other country has a juristocracy that is this powerful and that can't be checked. So no. like- Part of me wants to say, like, the answer to your question is, why is this happening? Because it was designed to, right? It was a minority rule, quote unquote, democracy that is still struggling to repair that. And so the answer for me is to check the court, right? Like the court gave itself the power of judicial review in Marbury versus Madison. That was not intentional. We have this magical idea that nine justices is in the Constitution. It is not. There have yeah. historically been six and eight and 10 justices. All of this is fixable. So I, I almost want to say that the same magical thinking that leads us to believe that the court is perfect and oracular and like has our best interest is the magical thinking that leads us to say we can't fix it. Right? It's two versions okay. of the same problem. Okay. Okay. So you'd say then... Uh, quit the court, <laughs> boycott, boycott the court, but no, no more seriously challenge its legitimacy in order to check it. Is that a... I no? think it's and I think it's okay. saying holistically, honestly, I mean, there were about eight minutes in constitutional history when the court wasn't a backward looking hyper conservative. Well, well that, that's my question is why don't we think of it as as a fundamentally backward looking <laughs> problematic institution that had occasional moments of, yeah, of, of freedom moments. expanding yeah. <laughs> as opposed to the way it's typically taught, which is a freedom expanding with occasional moments backsliding. And and, you know, Roberts knows this, which is why he we've talked about this before on your podcast is that he plays on the deep liberal instinct to think of it as a fundamentally glorious institution that we just don't happen to agree with some elements of but i hear you hesitating and maybe it's just because it's not possible but i hear you hesitating with judicial supremacy itself like why have it i i, I here's the thing that i think really has to be said it is a a, a colossal mistake for people to say 
the problem with the court now is that it's not following the polls, right? Because the court, like, right, we 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 right. we don't want a court that is just a third, you know, rubber stamp for majority rule. And that right. the best moments of the court, like, you know, we're sitting here joking, like, ha ha ha, I had seven good minutes in the 50s and 60s. But like, we got Brown, right? <laughs> we got, right. you know, we got Cooper versus Aaron. We did very well on, on, um, uh, uh, a whole bunch of uh, of things, Loving versus Virginia. So we don't yeah. have a court that just follows majorities. We want a counter majoritarian check, but this court isn't that. <laughs> this court is right. bought and sold by you know the Federalist Society and multi million dollars in dark money. I mean, you know this better than me. So I think we can have, we can be very realistic about what at its like high water mark the court can and should be. And I'll say that if you are like spending millions of dollars to seat justices in order to make sure that the Chamber of Commerce wins every time or that like certain religions win every time or that gun manufacturers win every time, that's not a counter majoritarian court. That's not a check right. on popular opinion. That's actually like suppressing democratic will. So in my head, they're two different buckets. Yep. And it's Partly why, you know, I could, whether I'm naive or not, cover the court like with some sense of reverence and regard, even if I disagreed with them. No, that makes sense. Right. Because your your ultimate, I mean, there's one vision, which is different institutions for different times, but you do have a vision of there being for our particular country and context, um, a, a counter majoritarian check. Um, that does have have that bill of rights in hand. <laughs> um. Right. And also that I think it's really important to recognize that, you know, we don't, I, I guess this gets back to, you know, th this is the, if, if the subtext of the book is welcome to my breakdown, like this really is it. There's no doubt in my mind that the 2024 election will be decided in the Supreme Court, right? And if it's not decided in the Supreme Court, like, is it going to be like people with like, you know, sharpened, you know, poles and, and sticks in, in the halls of Congress? Like, it, it goes back to like, you know, Anita Hill's point, which is like violence and chaos don't redound to the benefit of most of us. So I actually want a stable and functioning court because it seems to me that if we're inexorably headed there, let it be a thing that A, works and B, kind of triangulates, as you said, by actual constitutional and statutory values. Yeah. And let it be a thing that people believe in. We've got a 25% approval rating at the court now. And so I just think like this is, a, it's not court bashing to say the court is currently operative is doing the opposite of justice. And that's not because I don't like the ruling in Dobbs. Right, right. Wow, well, I totally stole a few of those last questions that came in. Thank you for the questions. Um, I, I There's nobody's breakdown I'm more privileged to be at the front seat of. And for those of you who haven't read this book, and I, I say this not, uh, you know, you should read it, but it, because it, it is sort of a braided history of law, of constitutional and trial and activism and voting rights captured in a moment in history, you know, bookended by Pauli and Murray and um, uh, Hill. And uh, it's, it will force you to think while demanding that you act. <laughs> which I think is um, an extraordinary ambition um, against either not thinking and acting <laughs> or not acting and only thinking, and both of which are the sort of two temptations. And in that way, I think it's a very courageous book because it is uh, courageous to uh, do both at the same time. So thanks for this uh, wonderful opportunity and for Marsha and, um, uh, read the book. Thank you. Boy, wow. I I, I want to thank you both for 
what a gift this conversation was. Um, it was riveting. Um, it was motivating. And it made a whole lot of sense. Um, so, um, so I, and I thank you both for your work. We're going to put um, a link in the chat again to the community bookstore and so that you can explore the book and purchase it at an independent bookstore. Um, I cannot thank both of you enough for this incredible conversation. Uh, I wanna wish everybody, I just wanna make sure, Ayan, are you there? Are you putting a link in the chat? I just wanna make sure that goes in, please. Um, well, it's at the top of the chat if you, um, if you, if you scroll back. Um, and um, I hope you have a great night and, you know, rest your brains because they're extraordinary <laughs> and have a good night, everybody else. Thank you for being here. Good night. <laughs>